Come on, isn't that great? Welcome to Iglesia. And uh, thank you so much, worship team, for leading us in worship today. We're excited. We're in part number quattro of Walk the Talk. Turn with me in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter number 4. We're going to be studying today the fourth chapter of the book of 1 Peter. If you missed the first three weeks, you can catch back up. But we're studying how to walk the talk. And I'm not tired of using the joke. Walk it, look it, talk it. It's not, it's not old yet. But uh, we're trying to learn how to follow Jesus, how to be sincere followers, and how to not talk a big game, but to live, live our faith, live in sincerity. What does it mean to be a Jesus person? And we just, we're trying to figure it out as a community. And so when you join a community, by the way, let's give room for people to grow. Let's give room for people to make mistakes and fail and get back up and try again. We serve the God of second chances. We serve the God of third chances. And anybody grateful today that God does not hold you hostage to your decisions, but he says as far as the east is from the west, he's removed your transgressions from you. So we're studying this book and we're going to jump into chapter number four. But we said that we have a theme verse that we are all memorizing. I don't know if you memorized this verse yet. I'm looking around the MC, seeing which one of these godly people memorized the verse yet. But we're memorizing together as a community. Our theme verse out of this book study is 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 9 from the New Living Translation. And uh, instead of me reading our theme verse, I thought it'd be cool if some people from Zoe, because you know they're holy people in our church, from all across the country, they're going to read our theme scripture that we're all memorizing together. So check out this video of them reading our verse. 1 Peter 2.9 But you are not like that. You are holy priests. A holy nation. For you are a chosen people. God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Come on, I love that. You are not like that. You're God's chosen people. You're a priest. You're a marvelous light. I love the Bible is speaking to you identity. Remember, God always tells you who you are, and the enemy always tells you who you're not. The enemy tries to challenge your identity, but God declares your identity. Oh, he says, you're my son. You're my daughter. You are called. You're anointed. You are chosen. You are forgiven. You are mine. Oh, I've made you. I've formed you. I know how many hairs are on your head. I know when you sit down and when you stand up and when you go out and when you come in. More than the sands of the seas, so were the thoughts of the Lord towards you. The reason why we're memorizing that verse is you need to hear identity. Because identity builds confidence. Identity gives you courage. If you know who you are. By the way, you just never know who you are until you know whose you are. And once I understand I belong to God, I've got the imprint of heaven on my life, oh, I can go forward. I love the Bible literally says the righteous are as bold as a lion. See, when you get God's thoughts and God's promises and God's ideas, God's identity, you can live with a boldness. And I'm believing that over your life this year. Has it been an awesome start to 2022? I'm telling you, I'm so happy today. It's my last day of no coffee. Tomorrow morning, I will wake up and for the first time in 21 days, taste and see the Lord is good. I've been seeing it. I have not been tasting it. Tea is not for everybody. Coffee is for the godly people that love the Lord and the nectar of heaven. But uh, we're really proud and really excited. Let's clap for everybody that did the fast. Whether you did seven days, 14 days, 21 days, thank you for fasting with us. The next time we do this is in the fall. We do it twice a year. The fall one doesn't have the fast part, uh, but we pray twice a year like this. And so if you're part of Zoe, we'll do this again in the fall. Okay, I want to jump in to chapter number four today. And I want to give you the theme right from the start. In fact, write down the title of today's message. This is what chapter four is about. Write down this title. Big things happen 
when you do the little things right. So let's start with the little things. You know, little stuff might seem minute, might seem minuscule, might seem not that important. But if you do the little things right, big things will happen. And I want to convince you that it's not about living for the big. It's about taking care of the small stuff. You know, like crossing the T's and dotting the I's and getting things right and making sure we understand where God is leading us and what he wants for us. So big things happen when you do little things right. I remember the famous UCLA basketball coach, John Whitten. He used to teach the first thing when his players would show up to Pauley Pavilion in Westwood, California. The first thing that he would do, the great legendary NCAA champion of champions, 11 championships uh, that he won. Can you believe that? He, the first thing that he would teach them is how to put on their socks. Wasn't shooting. Wasn't passing. It wasn't dribbling. It was how to put on your socks. Because in that era, he knew that if our, his guys didn't know how to put on their socks, they would get blisters. And if they got blisters, they couldn't play. I wonder if you're getting into the details like of your socks getting the details of the little stuff of life. Because the more that you can walk in the little stuff, it'll make way for the big stuff. And so Peter, because of his genuine nature, because he's had success and failure, he is teaching us how to take care of the small stuff in our life. Here's the first thing. I'm going to give you four things today. Here's the first one. They're all L's. The first thing he says is live for God and not yourself. Live for God and not yourself. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 1. He says this, So then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer. Somebody's like, hold on. I thought it was be ready to be blessed. Be ready to suffer too. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have already finished with sin. Look what he says, verse 2. You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires, but you will be anxious to do the will of God. <laughs> God he is saying, live for God and not yourself. He's saying, he's saying understand this. If you, if you really submit your life to God, you won't live for your own desires, but you will have anxiety or you will be anxious to do God's stuff. I just love what the Bible's teaching us because we live in a culture that has pressure to perform, pressure for results. Oh, we, you know, if we talk to somebody, it's like, oh, my 2022 20, resolutions, my goals and my dreams, I'm going to accomplish this. I'm going to produce that. I'm going to go here. And we start thinking about our own desires. He says, no, someone that walks the talk, they are anxious about God's desires. They die to self. Oh, I love what John says in John 3, verse 30. Put it on the screen. He says, I've got to decrease, and he's got to increase. He's saying, don't live for yourself. Don't live for your own time and your own treasure and your own talent. No, live for the glory of God. Come on, don't have pressure to perform for yourself. Have, have, a, have a heart to serve the Lord with gladness. See, you will live a miserable life if you live for self. You will live an empty life if you just live for you. And I, I don't, don't buy the lie. Don't believe the hype of narcissism. You know, our culture in a narcissistic society, narcissism wins. Don't you believe the lie that narcissism fills your tank? No, doing the will of God fills your tank. Oh, I'll never forget one time they came to Jesus, and they're like, Jesus, it's been a while since you, do you need a Lara bar, Jesus? Or do you like Quest? Do you like the natural stuff? Or do you like your bars chalky? What kind of a bar? You look hungry, Jesus. He says, no, no, fam, you don't even understand. I have food to eat that you don't even know of. My food that fuels me is doing the will of the Father. Come on, clap in your house if you want to serve God. Come on, I want to die to myself. I want to live for Jesus. I don't want to have the pressure to perform and the pressure for results and the pressure to build my brand and the pressure to build my business. I want to be anxious to do God's will. 
Peter understands. He says, I used to have a business. I was in the fishing industry. I remember grinding it out. I remember crunching the numbers. I remember trying to build our business. He said, that stuff didn't fill my tank, but trying to do God's will, it fuels me. It injects me. It builds me. Come on, anybody thankful today that we don't want to live for self? We want to live for God. What is it about ego? What is it about pride that we have to fight the arrows of our heart coming in? We got to get the arrows of our heart going out. We got to stop asking the question, what do I need? We got to start asking the question, God, what do you want? We got to stop praying, let my will be done. And we got to start praying, Lord, let your will be done. There's humility here. There's brokenness here. There's dependence here. He is saying, no, 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 if you've already counted it to suffer for Jesus. Remember, the Bible teaches us, for it has been granted unto you not only to believe in Jesus, but to suffer for him also. He said, when you get to the level of you're down to suffer for God, it's not just suffering sickness or suffering sorrow, or, but I'm okay with being claimed and named in the God camp. He said, when you get there, what's happening is you stop living for your own desires. You start living for God desires. Have you died to yourself yet? Have you died to your own dreams and your own ambitions? And have you laid them down at the feet of Jesus to say, Lord, what I really crave is your will. What I really want is to do your business. So the first thing he teaches us is live for God and not yourself. Watch the next one, number two. I love this. He says, love people. Write this down. Love people and host them well. Verse 7, watch this. The end of the world is coming soon. It's like some Armageddon stuff right there. Got Ben Affleck just crossing my forehead. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. Cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal and a place to stay. Cheerfully share, cheerfully love people, prefer people, help people. But I love that he's talking about hospitality. He's talking about hosting people in your home. Now, I love this because this reflects Acts chapter 2 when the church first started. I'm telling you, when the church first started, this is what they were doing every day. They were reading the Bible together every day. They were praying together every day. But house to house, they were sharing meals together. They were getting around tables, and they were having a meal together. There's something powerful about getting around a table and sharing food with somebody. Oh, the Bible, we call it breaking bread together, and that's about to happen tomorrow, okay? We're going to break bread. Oh, I miss bread in Jesus' name. Can't wait. I've, th I've thought about what my first meal is going to be tonight. I can't decide if it's tacos, but I might save that for Tuesday. But I thought about having some pizza. I feel like pizza is a good entry point. We're talking cheese, pepperoni, and some bread. I feel the Holy Ghost when I said it. But, but when the church started, it started around tables. And they were breaking bread together. They were sharing meals together. This is last week. I was invited to one of our friend's birthday parties. And when I got to this house, it was a beautiful long table. And there was all these flowers set up and candles that were lit. A beautiful spread of food. Everyone there was there to cheer on and celebrate this one individual. And as we, the table was set, beautiful conversations transpired. People were actually crying because of the God thoughts that were being shared at this table. See, there's something powerful that happens not only in church, but there's something powerful that happens around the table of the Lord. I want to encourage you. The reason why God is asking you to host people is because God has decided to host you. The reason why God says invite people around your table is because God has invited you around his table. God has asked you with all your issues and all your baggage and all your brokenness and all your problems and all your trauma, he has asked you to come and sit at the table of the Lord. He has said, no, 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 I know you might not be perfect. You might not have it all together, but come and sit with me, dine with me. Oh, I love the story in the Old Testament where, where King Saul he starts looking through the lineage, and he's like, I just want to find out 
the king that was before me, I'm sure there's somebody that must be a part of their family that could come sit at my table. And they go through the lineage and they find out there's one person in the family left that doesn't come to this table here in Jerusalem. His name is, it's my favorite biblical name, Mephibosheth. <laughs> Mephibosheth lives in Lodebar. Translated, it's the place of no communication. Have you ever felt like you were far off from God? Have you ever felt like you don't deserve God to talk to you or speak to your life? Have you ever felt unworthy for the king to call your name? Have you ever felt like there's no way that I can sit with all these other people that seem to have their act together? No, the king calls for Mephibosheth to come. And it says in 2 Samuel 3 that Mephibosheth, he always sat at the table of the king. Do you realize that though you don't deserve it and though you don't earn it, you can't tithe your way, read your way, pray your way, give your way, serve your way? Come on, it is all grace and it is all God. He has invited you to sit at the table of the Lord. And because we've received a seat, God calls us in that spirit to host people, to entertain people, to welcome people into our homes. Julie and I both grow up, grew up in homes where there was always people in our house. There was always some, some strangers at the table. There was always some pastor that was needing help or some person in the church that was going through a hard time. Our house, I didn't spend a Christmas by, by ourselves with just our family for years. I mean, there's always somebody living with us that, that couldn't afford rent or going through a hard time. My parents modeled hospitality, showing us how to help people and rehabilitate people. You realize that the word hospital is in the word hospitality. See, when you go into a hospital, you come in torn and and beaten, and broken, and bruised. But when you walk out of the hospital, you walk out with a solution. You walk out put together. You walk out after surgery. Come on, God's asking you to be hospitable. He's saying, say, no, 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 invite them over. I know all you got is ramen and hot pockets. Invite them over. Put them twice through in the microwave, and let that pepperoni one bless them in Jesus' name. So the first one he teaches us is you need to live for God, not yourself. The second one is love people. Love covers a multitude of wrongs. See, if you're in the exposing business, if you're looking to point fingers at others, oh, I love the definition of love in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not rude. It is not proud. It is not easily angered. Love, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. Love always trusts, always protects, always hopes. Love never fails. When I operate in love, I cover my friends. When I operate in love, I cover my family. When I deal in a cruelty, when I haven't received the love of God, I expose the wrongs of others. I keep records of wrongs who've wronged me. See, love covers, the Bible's teaching us this today, love covers a multitude of wrongs. And not only does it cover, but it also invites people around their table. So love people well. Hear me, Zoe. Love people well. Love people well and host them in your home. Here's the third thing that he teaches us is another L. By the way, L-bombs. I love L-bombs. This is an L-bomb. You know, the first time I told Julia that I loved her, she said, thank you. <laughs> so a little sensitive when I drop L-bombs. Here's another L-bomb. Write down number three. Let God use your gifts. Here he goes in verse 11. Let God use your gifts. Verse 11, this is what he says. He says, for example, if you have a speaking gift, speak as though God were speaking his words through you. If you have the gift of serving, do it passionately with the strength God gives you. So that in everything, God alone will be glorified through Jesus Christ. For to him belong the power and the glory forever throughout all the ages. Amen. Peter is echoing. Let me show you another verse. Peter was echoing what Paul, the apostle, writes to the church in Rome. 
Watch what he says in Romans chapter 12. Look at verse 6. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So Peter is saying what Paul said. Both of them are recognizing we all have gifts from God. Now, let's just be honest. All of us love gifts. Can I get a Pentecostal amen in the church? I don't care if it's Christmas. I don't care if it's birthday. By the way, one of our camera operators, it is Roman's birthday today. Let's all clap and shout out online, Roman Bosco. Everybody loves getting a, getting a gift. In fact, one of our kingdom builders sent me a gift this last week. They sent me a $100 Starbucks gift card, and they said, your first coffee is on me. I cried. <laughs> we all love to receive gifts. Did you realize that the talent you are carrying is a gift from God? It is supernatural. It is God-ordained. The reason why you're so good with numbers is because God made you good with numbers. The reason why you're so creative God made you so creative. If you have the gift to talk, it's because God gave you the gift to talk. If you have the gift of giving, it's because God gave you the gift of receiving. Whatever gift you have, it is not for your own glory. It is not for your own brand. It is not for your own name. No, we don't even glorify our gifts. They're not even ours. They're from God. They are a gift. And when you understand, I've been given this from heaven. God made me this way. I didn't earn this. It's just, it's been talking to people is natural to me. Being around others is natural to me. Being an accountant is natural. Whatever it is, teaching, lawyer, whatever business it is, whatever comes natural to you, that's your grace and that is your gift. And he is saying, no, 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 don't let your gifts go to waste. Don't put your gift on a shelf. Don't let your gift be put away or swept under the rug. He says, no, that gift needs to be on display. People will see your gift and they will not glorify you. Come on, clap today if you want God to get all the glory. I don't mean to be a spoiler. I hate when people do this about movies, but I feel like it's in bounds today. Sing 2. Oh, I love Sing 2. Sing 2 is, I'm telling you, one of the best soundtracks ever. We watched Sing 2, rented it, watched it a thousand times. All we listen to in our Swagger Wagon minivan is Sing 2 right now. And Sing 2, my favorite part of the story is Clay Calloway. Clay Calloway is Bono in the movie. Again, there's a lot of spoilers going to go on right now. Clay, Close your ears if you want to sing too and you don't want a spoiler. Clay Calloway is Bono. Long story short, Bono is sitting on his gift. Bono is refusing to play the guitar. Bono is refusing to sing his songs. Somebody has to go to his house, break down the door, encourage him, and tell him, Bono, <laughs> Mr. Calloway, the world needs you. Your gift was not meant to live alone. You were created by God to play the guitar and sing a melody that lifts souls and lifts spirits. See, I want to encourage you, it's not just Clay Calloway's of the world that has gifts. All of us have been given gifts from the glory of God. And we're to use these gifts and use these talents and use these resources, not for our own benefit, but for the glory of Jesus Christ. Come on, anybody excited? Come on, to acknowledge the gift. Oh, I wonder your personality. I wonder your what we call the Christian hor horoscope, which is the Enneagram. Well, I, I, wa I wonder what the way God made you. But can we just resolve today? Can we just acknowledge that it's not your own doing? You didn't work that hard. Sure, you've honed it. And sure, you've worked on your craft. And sure, you've gotten a little bit better. But it's God-ordained. And I want to encourage you, businessman. I want to encourage you, business leader. I want to encourage you, songwriter. I want to encourage you, writer, today. Come on, let God get the glory. Don't use your gift to monetize. Don't use your gift to leverage. Use your gift to bring praise to the name of Jesus Christ. I just love that he's like, you've got the gift to serve? Then serve. You got the gift to give? Give. You got the gift to encourage? Encourage. You got the gift to eat? Pizza tonight. 
What is your gift? Don't sit on your gift. Jesus, it's almost like he says, you know, who would ever light a candle and hide it away? He says, let your light so shine so that men would see your gift, see your good works, and they'll glorify the Father. You know something's wrong when you're operating in your gift and people see you. No, you should deflect so the glory goes to God. I don't want any of the praise. I don't want any of the accolade. I don't want any of the attention. I want all the praise to be, wow, how good and how awesome is our God. Come on, clap together. Here's the fourth and the final thing he teaches us today. John, why don't you come up and and join me? This is the last one. Number four, look for God's grace in tough times. Look for God's grace in tough times. This is going to be our our longest reading of the day. The last verse, we'll conclude with this. By the way, shout out next Sunday. You cannot miss Pastor Julia's preaching next Sunday. And I have to say that so she doesn't back out. She's concluding our Walk the Talk series. Praise God. I'm going to be sitting right there shouting you down. Last verse, verse, verse 12, starting verse 12. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through <laughs> as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. If you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed for the glorious spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, watch this part, verse 15. If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. But it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. In other words, what he's saying is, You know, if you suffer, you should suffer for the right stuff, not the wrong stuff. Like if you suffer, let it be suffering for standing up for your faith. If you suffer, let it be suffering for being a Jesus follower. But don't let it be the wrong stuff. You know, like murder, stealing, causing trouble, getting into people's affairs. All that stuff's just drama. That's called self-inflicted pain. Don't bring, listen, life is hard enough. Don't bring a bunch of problems into your life. No, no, live at peace with people. Bless people, love people, forgive people, serve people, help people. Don't, no, no, no. Don't worry about what they're doing. Worry about what you're doing. Don't get into other people's affairs. Don't cause trouble. Be a peacemaker. Be known for love. Be known for grace. He said, if you suffer, don't let it be the wrong stuff. Let it be the right stuff. You know, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who stood up for their beliefs and said, well, I don't care what the rest of culture says. We are Jesus people. And they got thrown into a fiery furnace. And they're sitting there in the fiery furnace. And right before they got thrown in, they said to the king of the land, even if you throw us in, I want to tell you, we believe that our God has the power to save us. Oh, and when they got thrown into that fiery furnace, all of a sudden the king looked in and there appears a fourth man. A fourth man we believe is the Christ man. Well, I just want to encourage you, if you go through hell and back, Jesus will be with you. That's why my Bible says in Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You're going through fiery troubles. You're going through pain. Don't let it be the self-inflicted stuff. Let it be because you are counted as a follower of Christ. I was talking to this guy the other day, and he was telling me about his brother's band. Been around for a long time, and they were able to last this persecution, so to speak. They blew up, and a lot of the media got mad because they found out these guys were Christians. And so this this public writer started going after them, saying we shouldn't play these guys on the radio because of their beliefs. They're Christians. So they they were put aside because of their faith. It wasn't their melody. It wasn't their lyrics. 
It wasn't their aesthetic. It wasn't their videos. It was their faith. And he said somehow, some way, they just kept going and God kept providing them and they made it through that battle and they're on the other side. And I just wonder when you go through it, because some of us, we're going to go through this. People in your workspace, you know, why are you a Christian? Why do you follow God? Why are you, why do you go to church? Why do you read the Bible? Why do you serve? Why do you show up for I love my city? How come you, and people are mad at the light that is in you. He says, no, 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 guys, I've been there. I've done that. And when the world got mad at me, I couldn't stand and suffer for it. And once I failed and learned how to go through this trial, now on the other side, I make sure I'm good. I want to encourage you today. Live for God and not yourself. I want to encourage you today. Host people. and Love them well. Let me encourage you today. Lean in and look for God to be there in your darkest moments. Whether it's self-inflicted or world-inflicted, God will be there. And I know it may seem like small stuff. Hosting people at my house, not a big deal. No, but if you do the small things right, big things will happen. It's like, just had pizza and salad and we're just sitting around the table and somebody opened up and they experience Jesus. I just made it my ambition to serve God and all of a sudden God put me in opportunities and rooms and gave me the ability to share Christ and I never would have gotten that. if I wouldn't have made the small decision of saying, Jesus, today's yours and I live for you and not me. I was like, it's like a small choice, but it's like, I'm okay if I got to suffer some persecution and suffer some people that don't like me because I'm a Jesus person. I'm small it's going to make a big difference for other people around you to go, wow, they withstood that test. And even when they got through in the fire, they looked for God and God graced them and gave them power to endure. See, small stuff. Like put on your socks. Big things break out. See, I don't want us to live as a church where it's like, we're looking for these 10 pointers, these big moments and big opportunities and big stuff. Quite the opposite. Just trying to be faithful, trying to be humble, trying to be submitted, trying to follow Jesus. If I take care of the small stuff, God, by his infinite wisdom and infinite timing, will bring me into the big stuff. It's the compound of consistency. Amen today. Let me pray for you. Jesus, we thank you for a church that lives for you and not for self. We thank you that we love people and cover their weaknesses. Help us to be hospitable like no other. Give us the gift of hospitality. We pray right now, Lord, these gifts and talents and the things that you've given to us, we recognize we're not self-made. We didn't, we didn't buy this. We didn't go to camp to learn this. This is your gift. God, we will use our gifts for the glory of Jesus Christ. And we say right now, I know we're in a fiery trial. I know we might be in the blazing fire, but we're going to look for your help. We have never seen the righteous forsaken. We say to our church, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and we are safe. We thank you that you will guard us. You will protect us. We say the name of the Lord, the most high, is our shadow, is our refuge, is our covering. We thank you for it today. We thank you, Jesus, that we will walk the talk. We want to be real. We want to be genuine. We want to be sincere. Lord, we don't want to have one foot in the world and one foot in you. We want to be all in on following you. We don't want to look behind to see what's going on. We want to have our eyes straight fixed on Jesus. We thank you, God, that you would propel us forward out of this fast and into connect groups. We thank you that we will be in community. We will day by day pray. We will day by day read the word. We will day by day host each other. And God, we will encourage one another another to use our gifts. We will encourage one another when we go through trial. We will encourage one another to die to self and live for God. We thank you, Jesus, for all these things. Because none of it is possible without you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, come on, let's clap and thank the Lord. Come on, right there in the chats, let's clap and thank Jesus for his grace. I'm telling you, what is your life going to look like using your gifts for God? Come on, I just feel like this week you need to host somebody. 
have someone send out a text. We're having people over this week. We're going to cook. You, you know, church is built off potlucks. You ain't a part of a church till you like, bring, you know, bring the potato salad. You bring, it's always good to send a text to somebody that can't cook. You bring the drinks. That, when someone says bring the drinks, they're saying, I have no confidence in your ability to whip something up in the kitchen. Just get the Perrier and the San Pellegrino. But let's host. Let's get done with anxiety for our, our business. And let's be anxious about pleasing God. And if you're in a fiery trial, good news. God is with you. The Lord is our shepherd. The Lord is our help. We love you so much, church.